So at this time, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, DPIAs under the GDPR, and when do you truly need them? Thank you for joining us today. So let's get started. Um, my name is Douglas Ribak. I'm the VP of Marketing, and our guest speaker is Scott uh, Giordano. Uh, according to Article 35 of the EU General uh, Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, data controllers must conduct a data protection impact assessment, or DPIA, when the planned processing of personal data is likely to result in high risk to the rights and freedoms of natural persons. So this requirement begs many questions, such as how do you know what qualifies as high risk, what goes into the DPIA, and what about profiling? So in this webinar, our guest presenter will cover four main topics, the risk factors that should be considered, when a DPO or data protection officer is necessary, whether attorney-client privilege is required, and how data discovery and classification can address this issue. So at this time, I'd like to introduce our uh, guest speaker, Scott Giordano. Scott Giordano is a highly regarded data privacy attorney with over 20 years of experience and is currently a director at Robert Half Legal. Uh, welcome, Scott. Thank you, Doug. Uh, so at this time, Scott, please take it away. Sure, wonderful. Thank you for having me, uh, Doug. This is a, it's very interesting that we're having this webinar today. Uh, we just finished a DPIA for a client yesterday, and we're going to be starting one tomorrow. So uh, for whatever reason, in the past 30 days or so, we've just gotten so many requests for DPIAs. So I'm really hoping to help everyone understand just when they're necessary, when they when they might be necessary, when they're desirable, even if they're not quote unquote necessary, I'm getting using air quotes here, but uh, likely desirable for a variety of reasons. So we're going to talk about all those things and uh, really want to encourage people to ask questions. Um, this is These opinions are my own. I'm not uh, giving you legal advice, but I am giving you uh, my analysis of, of what we know about the, uh, the regulation. And also I'm going to be referring to two documents. One is WP248, uh, so that's Working Party Document 248 on um, DPIA, and then also the uh, ICO, Information Commissioner's Office, the UK has an excellent document on DPIAs as well, so I'll be spending a lot of time on both. So with, without further ado, let's go to the, the, the next slide. So um, what is a, a DPIA? I noticed I've highlighted a couple things here. Um, it, it's a process, and it's designed to, to describe the processing and assess the necessity of the processing and the proportionality meaning are you collecting more data than you need to, are you processing more than you need to, et cetera, um, to help manage risks um, to rights and freedoms. And I put that in red because that usually uh, elicits the question, what are rights and freedoms? So we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, WP248, and, and I'm citing the most recent version. This is the April version. It's Rev01. Um, they say, in other words, DPIA is a process for building and demonstrating compliance. And it's really important to think of it in those terms, it's not just a something you've got to do, uh, as it were, and then you put it on the shelf and you're done with it. It's really a tool that you're going to be using again and again and again for certain systems that you have that are in scope. And then we'll talk about what I think is likely going to be in scope. Um, as a practical matter, and again, this is my viewpoint, this is a risk management or risk mitigation process. You're going to spend a lot of time playing what if, um, how could bad people make misuse uh, of the data that you have, and if so, what risks to the rights and freedoms uh, to your data subjects do you have. So let's go to the, the next slide here, and we'll talk about rights and freedoms because I get the question all the time. What are these rights and freedoms that we're talking about? This seems like a really strange concept to us here in the U.S. We don't, you know, we, we talk about rights and freedoms in different contexts. So here it's the idea that uh, because your data may be compromised or misused or abused, that it is uh, potentially impinging on your other kinds of rights, freedom of, free, uh, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of thought, conscience, etc., etc. Think about all the cases we see in the news about people getting doxxed, meaning that their personal data has been revealed to the whole world as a way of punishing them for their political beliefs or religious beliefs, whatever it is. But it's the idea that you don't want to collect more data than possible because if it's abused, it could be used to punish someone for political purposes, for example. And I mean, you can just on the news and see all the kind of things that go on like that every day and why that's so important. So let's uh, let's go to the next slide and we'll dig down uh, into more in the of the of the why. Um, so they talk about in uh, in uh, 
Article 35, this idea of a, of a high risk process. And I get this question all the time, what's high risk that? And the short answer is we don't know. Um, they give us a lot of examples of things that are high risk, but a lot of times those aren't terribly helpful. And I'm going to focus on the first one because that's the least helpful one in my view. Um, it talks about um, uh, systemic or systematic and extensive valuation of someone. Um, and it's based on automated processing and includes profiling. So think about profiling as tracking someone's movement and, and creating a model, trying to predict their behavior, for example. Maybe it's a purchasing behavior, but maybe it's behavior of how you're going to act or react in an employment situation, or if are you likely to commit embezzlement or something like that. I mean, the, the possibilities are endless. And, and, and on which um, decisions are based that produce legal effects. So what are legal effects? Good question. Uh, I have not seen any jurisprudence that I would rely on at this point to even get an idea of what we talk about, um, what, we, what we mean when we talk about legal effects. I haven't seen a lot. So, so item A here is not terribly helpful at this point. I'm hoping that when we'll get more guidance from uh, the Article 29 Working Party at some point, but right now I don't see a lot of guidance. So we're going to go on other things that we do know. Uh, another one is processing on a large scale of special categories of data. So if you're a hospital, for example, you can pretty much guarantee it's high risk just because medical, medical data is Article 9 data, as I call it, special data. If you are one of those companies that um, checks criminal records to see if someone's eligible to vote, for example, and so you're processing criminal records, good example of, uh, of high risk, uh, almost certainly. Um, systematic monitoring of publicly accessible um, areas. So if you're monitoring the freeways or, or publicly trafficked areas and you're able to identify people, maybe through facial recognition or, or license plate recognition, um, good example of definitely a high risk process. So B and C are much easier to work with. A is, is at this point not terribly helpful for us. So the next slide, Doug. Um, these are some great questions to ask. I'm not going to go through all of these with you. I mean, these are things that you can look at on, on your own. But uh, these are all the kind of questions you want to ask about worst case scenarios. Um, um, I, I, my favorite one on here, uh, project um, uh, using new technology. So you think about um, all the ideas that we have about how you can use new technology, big data, um, to, to take existing data and to do things with it that perhaps people um, did not think about when it was collected in the first place. So big data is a great opportunity um, as a process to, to create high-risk situations that you wouldn't have thought of when you collected the data in the first place. So well, again, one of my favorite ones, I'm not going to go through all these, but this is the um, Conducting Privacy Impact Assessments Code of Practice by the ICO. Um, I love the ICO's documents. Uh, they really write some good stuff, so highly recommend this for all of us. Um, go to the next slide, Doug, if you will. Um, here's some candidates. Again, this is from the same document, some candidates, and some of these things you're not going to be terribly surprised um, with. So a new IT system, um, and this is the majority of my requests are for IT system-based uh, DPIAs. It's usually an HR system. Um, or perhaps if you're a processor and you're doing uh, processing on behalf of someone else, then you want your system to be reviewed to make sure that um, uh, a third party has looked at it to see if there's any uh, weaknesses or, or things that you've done uh, that are probably not best practice. So new IT systems, probably your number one candidate for DPIAs, or if you're making major improvements on an IT system, again, a great, um, a great candidate. But there's other ones here that um, are, are certainly relevant. Um, the fourth one, fifth one down, uh, um, any kind of closed circuit TV system, for example, or surveillance system. This also includes surveillance systems for information security. So if you're um, using a managed security services provider, you can make an argument that that's a surveillance system because you're sniffing all the, the uh, uh, traffic data through your network. So a DPIA likely going to be a candidate for that because it's just so, it's considered so intrusive. So these are all good, again, good examples. I won't go through all of these, but you really want to ask yourself, um, what could I do to abuse or, or misuse this data, especially if a bad guy got hold of it? Um, those are great DPIA candidates. So let's go to the next slide, Doug, and I'm going to dig, dig into some more here. Okay. So this is the process. If you uh, looked at uh, WP248, they give this flow chart, which is, is nice. It, it summarizes the whole process. Um, so the first square on the upper left, asks, is something likely to result, something being your, your data processing, um, likely to result in high risks? We just covered that. Um, is there an exception? Likely there won't be any exceptions at this point um, based upon uh, Article 35. So then the question is, okay, then do the DPIA. And then as a function of that, 
when you've done the DPIA, are there residual high risk? Meaning that after you've applied all of your mitigation strategies uh, or you've addressed mitigation in, in some way, are there still high risks that, that you simply can't do away with? At that point, if there are, you're likely going to have to consult with a data protection authority to see if you're still allowed to do the processing. Um, I haven't run into these yet where, uh, where the mitigation will not uh, sufficiently work, but that's certainly a theoretical possibility. So this is the, uh, this is the overview. It's nice. Um, just to give you the big picture, um, but really uh, you have to go into the weeds to, to see the bigger, the bigger elements that are going to be issues for you guys. So go to the next slide. Okay, so getting started. Um, I probably the number one question I get is, okay, how do we get started, Scott? What what do we do, and how do we make it so that when you come to visit us, we are making this as simple as possible? Um, your Article 30 data processing or data inventory really is the is a the first place you want to, to start. If you have not done one, you really want to get one done before you do your DPIA. It's going to provide all your basic information. What are the data fields that are in scope here that are being collected? So um, say that uh, you have an HR database. There's all kinds of fields you're going to potentially collect. And that could be um, sensitive information. It could be medical information. It could be religious affiliation. There's all kinds of things. And, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. But um, you really want to get this done first so that you at least have a baseline uh, to start working from. Also, um, I would recommend, not surprisingly, um, that you validate this with data discovery and classification. So um, looking into your systems technically and, and checking to see what kind of data you're, you're collecting in practice versus what you think you're collecting. Um, every time I work with data discovery and classification, I always find folks that, that either find databases they didn't know they had a lot of times they're orphaned uh, databases that they use for some project and everyone forgot about, but it's, it's chock full of personal data, social security numbers or other kinds of things that they didn't know they had and they're surprised by it. So uh, always recommend, validate with data discovery classification. Um, let's uh, go to the next slide and I'll show you what a super basic Article 30 uh, uh, data inventory looks like. And so you can see the application or process name on the left. I've made these up, but they're based on real things. So Employee central, so an HR system, for example, what are you going to be collecting? Well, um, name, and employee and identification number, potentially the bank account number for payroll. Uh, payroll is always a great opportunity for mischief as far as someone breaking into your system and getting um, um, bank account information, for example, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so who are the recipients? Are they outside of your firewall? Um, are you using a third party? All these kind of questions you want to ask um, from the beginning. Also, what kind of contracts are involved? Are there data transfer mechanisms? So, for example, if you're working with a third party for payroll, um, do they use Privacy Shield? Do they use model contracts? How are they adhering to their Privacy Shield uh, uh, requirements or commitments? Same thing for model contracts. Uh, on the back of the model contract, you always have a list of technical and organizational security measures. Are, are they just uh, per uh, really performa or are they serious? They really list in detail the kind of things they're going to do. So you want to collect all this information because these are documents I review for DPIA. I look at a privacy shield certification. I look at a model contract clause. I look at the basic contract that you have with a third party. Look at all these things. And the third party should be able to, to supply you with useful information to help you with this. If they can't, then that's a red flag. Um, let's go to the, the next slide, Doug. Okay. So this is really where we're going to spend a fair amount of time this morning. Um, it's on the threshold analysis. This is the idea of saying, okay, and this is based on WP248, so I drew this directly from it, so we'll talk about this. It's the idea of, well, do we really have a, a, a high-risk process? Um, threshold analysis gets you uh, to, to an idea of, well, yeah, we've got one, or maybe we've got one, or maybe it's a medium-risk process, um, or it's a low-risk process. But either way, we want to go through the criteria and get an idea. Um, I spent some, a fair amount of time working with a client um, this week just using threshold analysis and asking all these, these questions, and the answers really drove um, the, the, the course of the DPIA. So this is something that I recommend everyone on the call spend some time doing. So we're going to go through these one by one. Um, so threshold analysis, evaluation, or scoring. So um, this is the idea of profiling and predicting. So say, for example, you're an e-commerce company, and you're watching where everyone's going on your site, where they're clicking and trying to build a model and get an idea of, of where they might um, click next or what you should serve them up in terms of ads, um, where they might 
uh, go through predicting behavior. So evaluation or, or scoring, um, definitely something that is, is a high risk item potentially um, if you do that. Also, um, if it's something that puts you on uh, a, let's say for example, a watch list, say the no fly list here in the US for example, or something like that, um, if someone has a score based on all these different criteria and once you meet, just meet a certain cutoff, you get put on a no-fly list, for example, or the equivalent. That's the kind of thing that is, is, is going to just shout high risk. So a good example of that. Um, also, if you have uh, at work HR exams, if you have uh, some kind of test some companies give to evaluate employees to predict their behavior, if they're likely to commit fraud, for example, um, that would all be evaluation or scoring. So I'm going to um, do a full stop here. Um, are there any comments or questions from the audience before we go on? None in the queue so at this point, Scott. Okay. Okay. Well, I want to definitely encourage that um, from the audience if, if you have questions as we, uh, as we go along here. Um, uh, the second one, and this is something I get a lot of questions about, automated decision making with, with legal effects. I mentioned earlier that it's, it's unclear still from a jurisprudence standpoint what are legal effects. So automated decision making. Um, we here in the U.S. we have the idea of getting a credit over the phone. Uh, based upon automated decision making. Uh, you look at someone's credit score and go, okay, so you're, it's safe for you to get credit. But how does that produce legal effects? Um, unclear to me, um, but it's something that we that has to be considered. Again, I'm hoping that, that the working party um, uh, 29 will be able to come up with something a little more extensive than what we have now. Um, we just don't have a lot of good information on what, what qualifies as legal effects. Um, next one down, um, uh, systematic monitoring. This is fairly um, easy. So if you are monitoring um, uh, the public, for example, um, say that, again, you've got a camera that monitors the public coming into your store, and so it points outward, and you're looking at everyone coming by uh, on the sidewalk at your store, potentially that's systematic monitoring, especially if it's cross-referenced with other information. That makes it a very big candidate to, uh, uh, to have systematic monitoring. Um, also, um, for information security purposes, um, one of the things that uh, it cites here is the idea of information collected through networks. So you can make the argument that um, if you have uh, something that, that examines all the packets going through your network, that's systematic monitoring. So information security software that, um, likely would qualify um, if it's doing that level of, of, of monitoring. Um, next one, sensitive data. So no surprise here. Uh, this is the idea that um, if you're processing, we'll say, for example, medical data, you can almost guarantee that it's going to be high risk. So if you're a medical institution or doing clinical research, even if you have anonymized data, um, even anonymized data with enough cross-references can be de-anonymized. De so as a practical matter, if you're a medical institution or you're having similar uh, kinds of data that you're, you're, you're uh, manipulating or, or processing, you can pretty much bet that's going to wind up to be a, a high-risk category. Next one is data processed on a large scale. So you may have just very basic data um, that you're collecting um, for whatever reason, but um, maybe perhaps census data, for example, or something of that equivalent, but you're doing it on a, on a large scale. Uh, and, and, and the audience is probably asking right now, well, what is qualifies as large scale? We don't know at this point. We don't have a lot of information from the working party on what, what qualifies. I expect we'll get more information down the road. So we have to take a guess as to what qualifies as large scale. So big things like census data, for example, you would probably consider to be large scale. I think that's probably the archetype for that. Um, but really, just you could be lots of, of really low-level data, like just email addresses, for example. Um, perhaps you have a marketing database, and you've got a million people in the marketing database. You have all of their email addresses. Just processing that on a large scale, you can make a very, a very good argument that that qualifies under this section here. Um, next one is combining or matching data sets. So I like this one as a high-risk item because imagine you've got a, uh, two completely different data sets that have common, um, uh, common data subjects, and they were developed for different purposes, and you're combining them and cross-referencing them. You could potentially uncover a lot of really personal information that you wouldn't have gotten otherwise by doing so. So whether you created a data set on your own and then bought a data set and matched it, um, but this is a big concern. And so um, if you have um, combined data sets, uh, that makes it very easy to wind up um, as a, um, a, a criterion fulfilled here for high risk just because of, of the idea that you weren't planning originally when you developed a given data set um, to, to reveal more than a minimum amount of data, but when you combine it, 
it does indeed do that. So a good example of that. Um, next one, and this is probably going to be the number one that you'll find relevant, is data concerning vulnerable data subjects. And I probably should have put that in quotes because vulnerable in this case can mean a lot of things. It can mean, for example, children. You're processing uh, personal data of children. It could be, um, and most likely, uh, employees because employees are considered to have in the EU unequal bargaining positions. So any data concerning um, vulnerable data subjects or employees are going to be likely um, throwing you into the high risk category. So, for example, your HR system, great candidate for data concerning vulnerable data subjects. You could have others, certainly, but I'd put that very high on the list here. And almost everyone on this call, I guarantee, is going to have some kind of an HRIS system. This is a good example of where this will, this will apply. Um, next one is new or innovative technology. So um, say, for example, again, we're to, I keep going back to big data because it's so common. If you're one of those companies that processes other people's data and you, uh, you certainly use big data to get ideas of, of what trends are going on or how people may uh, react to certain ad campaigns or whatever it might be, um, processing that using big data is a great opportunity for winding up qualifying for this criterion just because it's a new use of data that was not thought of at the time the data, um, the underlying data was created. And so you really wouldn't know how to, to limit collection uh, to protect against that. So big data, a great candidate, but there's certainly going to be plenty of other ones. And then um, this one here prevents um, a right or using a service or contract. Um, those of you, um, if you have operations in France, you're probably familiar with this because this is uh, basically copied and pasted from the French version of, uh, of the Data Protection Act um, uh, that uh, the CNIL enforces in France, and I ran into this quite a bit. So say, for example, that you have a scoring system or you have a uh, system that examines um, job candidates um, because you, um, you have certain kinds of projects you want them to work on. Um, say it's uh, for things working for the government, for working for the Defense Department or something like that. Um, you will often run into in challenges here because potentially they may not qualify uh, for some reason and that prevents them from the benefit of a contract, an employment contract, for example. Um, so this is something that I uh, uh, have a lot of experience with. It came up quite a bit um, because of, of government contracting. So this is something that uh, definitely if you're the defense establishment, you will run in, uh, against this quite a bit, um, especially when you're working overseas. So a good example of uh, preventing the right um, uh, of a um, uh, preventing a right or using a service or a contract. Um, Doug, if you have no questions, let's go to the next slide, and I'll dig into some of the details uh, of uh, of what's next. So, say that you go through all of those criteria, and you still are not clear whether to do a DPIA. Um, w WP29, Working Party 29, recommends you do one anyway, and I I have to agree with this as well. If in doubt, do a DPIA. I know it's a lengthy process, but if you're not sure, uh, it really behooves us all to dig more into this and get an idea of whether um, there's, there's some substance to, uh, to doing the DPIA to begin with. And just digging in, asking more questions, asking about data that the kind of data you're collecting and how it's being used and who, with whom you're sharing it, all these things are part of a DPIA. And if you're in doubt, do the DPIA. I guarantee you won't be sorry. Let's go to the next, uh, next question, Doug or next slide, rather. So um, part one, um, how do you get started doing the DPIA? One is starting to collect your basic information. Um, one of the things that you're going to do is you're going to talk to the business owners, both the technical and the business um, owners um, of the application. Say it's an HR system. We'll just use that because that's probably the most common one you'll do this for. Um, talk to the business owner who uses this every day. Uh, talk to the technical owner. Perhaps it's the administrator that is in charge of, of creating accounts or they're doing other kinds of maintenance. Um, you want to get them on board for, for each one of the applications in scope. Uh, find out um, if there is a, a co-controller or a processor relationship. Most likely, if you've got an HR database, uh, you're going to find that you have a third party that is the processor. And as a consequence, um, is there an associated contract? You really need to have that contract and look and see how it purports to protect personal data. That's part of the DPIA. If the contract is silent, then you've got you've got a big issue here. And so this is something that uh, one of the basic documents I always collect is the associated contract. Um, because you just don't know until you read it well, what the, uh, the third party is committing to um, versus what they should be committing to. So always uh, get a copy of that, 
have your legal folks look at that and see what uh, what kind of protection the third party is giving. A lot of third parties are very savvy about this, but some are not. Um, what's the reason for the inquiry? Typically, uh, there's a stakeholder involved that wants to know, uh, do we need to do a DPIA or should we do one just as the, out of an abundance of caution? So I would always know what's the reason for the inquiry. It's usually a stakeholder that, that's concerned about how the data is being used. And then get an idea of the nature of the processing. Um, are you simply collecting data uh, as part of a larger process? Um, are you, are you um, doing it for HR purposes and so you're, you're doing it to help manage the employee, pay the employee, promote them, et cetera, um, help them with travel um, arrangements, et cetera? So get an idea of what the nature of the processing is. Um, so that when a if there's an inquiry from a data protection authority, you can say yes, we we were processing their data for this these specific reasons. So get an idea ahead of time of exactly what the nature of the processing is and what's being done with the data. So the next slide, Doug. Okay. Um, source of the personal data. I, I touched upon this earlier that um, in most cases it's going to be directly from the employee, but um, just use other examples here. If you are doing uh, marketing databases and you're collecting different data sets and you're combining them and putting them into, uh, into one database, then that's something that you want to note the source, the sources of the personal data. You also want to know the categories of the personal data as well. This is, for, this is important because I break these up into three categories. I find that it's important to get regular personal data so like your name or your address, or your phone number. Um, online identifiers, so say that you're issued equipment and um, that equipment, uh, you have an IP address, you've got a MAC address. If that's part of the record that's in your HR record for, for whatever reason, then that's something that you want to note because again, that record could be cross-referenced with other information. So you always want to capture that. If you have special data, uh, most likely if you're doing an HR situation, you're going to be collecting a religious affiliation for folks in Germany. Um, if you have operations there. So you want to note that as well. That's special data, and that's something that requires a, additional consideration. Also, um, other data elements that you may um, uh, have. So an employee ID, you may have a national ID number of an, of an employee. Like here in the U.S., we have Social Security numbers. Um, if you collect those kinds of things um, from non-U.S. folks, you definitely want to note that as well because that's a, a, high, a higher risk element to have. Um, locations from which the data is gathered. So you're getting it from your operations in the EU. Um, so I would note the, the physical places that you're getting it from and the locations from which it will be accessed. So say that you've got third parties elsewhere in the world that are accessing this. Maybe they're accessing it to do engineering work. Say it's from China or India or Russia or what have you. Uh, you hire third parties to access it to do um, maintenance or upkeep. You want to note that as well um, because then it's going to beg the question, do you have a contract with them that has model contracts or other kinds of mechanisms for data protection. Um, note where the servers are um, as well, and also replication and backups. If say that you use Amazon Web Services, for example, then um, they have different availability zones. They have that you can say that you want something on the West Coast versus the East Coast versus in the EU itself. Um, some folks are very comfortable just saying, "Put my availability zone in the EU, in Ireland, or something like that." So you would you should note that. Um, I don't know if, if the location of the server is as important as it used to be, but um, certainly it should be noted. Um, documentation. Collect all the documentation you can. Um, again, if you're working with a third party, ask them for documentation. Sometimes it's, it's difficult to get documentation out of them, but I would ask anyway. Um, I always ask third parties, what are you doing to protect our data under um, GDPR? And usually they'll have some information about that, and I would uh, keep that and use that for review. Note the assets that are involved. So um, what hardware and software uh, versions are involved, what networks they're, they're going over. Is it, um, is it behind your own firewall? Is it completely outside of it? So I would note all those things as well. Let's go to the, to the next slide, Doug. Um, integrations with other systems. This is very important because in many cases, you will have your HRIS system feed into all kinds of other things. You may have 10 different applications that you feed into. It may be that you have uh, your training system, your LMS, for example. You may have a, uh, your travel database. You may have all kinds of systems that it feeds into. So I always recommend that you find all the things that it feeds into. It could be your spend management and make note of it because 
one, those systems may feed in other systems and you may lose track of where that data is ultimately winding up. Uh, retention period. Probably uh, one of the, the big challenges that uh, the clients often have is that they don't have a defined retention period. They haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it. In principle, you're not supposed to keep data longer than necessary. So there really should be some consideration on to how long you're keeping data. Uh, unfortunately, I run into a lot of folks that just say, oh, we keep everything forever. And that typically does not go over well with the uh, data protection authorities. So you really want to think ahead of time, do we really need to keep this data forever? And then data classifications. Um, one of the things I always try to do is if someone has a data classification schema, um, I want to be able to map to it and say, the data here that we're using is class three, it's restricted, or it's highly sensitive, or whatever term they use. So I always note that. Um, even if it's not an automated data classification system, I still always note if, um, if they have it classified to begin with. So HR data, for example, in a former um, uh, company um, I worked for, we always put US data as, uh, as, as restricted and uh, EU data is highly restricted. So we always made that distinction because I, EU data merited higher levels of protection. If I had to do it again today, I'd probably throw it all into highly restricted. Um, but back then, um, we had that delineation. So a good example of how data classification really plays a, a role in this. Go to the next slide, Doug. Uh, legal basis. So um, legal basis, very, very important. Um, this will create a lot of questions for you and a lot of discussions. Um, there's only six different bases that you can choose from. And typically for employee data, again, I'm going to use that as an example, uh, you can't use consent. Consent's not available. Um, uh, typically, it's highly disfavored, as we like to say, in the EU. So the only two options you have are contract, which I recommend, or if there's no contract that the employee is working under, then it's really part of the legitimate interest of the organization to, to employ the person and for the person to be employed, to pay them, to manage them, to promote them, all those kind of things. So I'd always note what the, uh, the basis is, um, just for your reference if you're going to be asked. Um, how is proportionality addressed? So for example, are you collecting more data than you need? A lot of times here in the US, we find that we've in the past collected way more data than we needed, but because you, you could collect it, we did collect it. And these are really for legacy systems. I think if you uh, were standing up a new system today, you wouldn't do that. But way back when, uh, we were collecting all kinds of things because that was just the nature of, of, of how we did things back then. Um, next is how are data subject rights being protected? So think about your right to access, uh, your right to rectification, the right to be forgotten, which is the big one now that everyone's hearing about. Um, how are they being protected? This is part of the, uh, of the DPIA. If there's no mechanism um, for that at this moment, then that's something that would be high up on your list. A lot of organizations don't have a very good system for doing this right now. And uh, a lot of them are working very hard before um, May 25th to get those kind of systems online so that when they do get data subject access requests, they can fulfill them fairly easily. So that uh, DSAR process, you should look at on a system by system basis and say, if I get a, a data subject access request for this system, how would I do it? How would I get the information? And how would I delete it if I was asked to delete it? Or if I can't delete it, what's my justification for not deleting it? So great question to ask for all these. Um, risks, what are the feared events? What are you concerned about? It may be you're concerned that a third party that's hosting this data is not doing a very good job uh, of protecting it based on things you heard in the news or what have you. And so the feared um, uh, event is that uh, bad guys are getting in and stealing it or that it's being lost. Um, here in the US, we've heard all kinds of horror stories about medical institutions throwing out paper records in the trash, just the regular trash, not sending it to a, uh, a shredder, for example. And, and getting fined as a result. So you have to ask yourself, what's the, the feared event? Is it employee um, negligence that they're not sending things to the shredder or not destroying things or not um, destroying hard drives or what have you after the data is no longer useful? Um, also, um, what might sub uh, data subjects not be able to do um, as a result? So um, perhaps, uh, again, if you're um, an organization that's, that's uh, publishing, I'm sorry, uh, processing criminal records, if, if you are not doing it correctly and you're misidentifying folks, potentially those people may not be able to vote because uh, you flagged them incorrectly. That would be a, a huge risk uh, involved and in why uh, you're doing a DPIA to begin with. And also, what's the source of the risk? Um, oftentimes, the source is going to be your own employees because they're not properly trained or they're not aware of the, uh, of the security risks involved. 
As I like to say, um, employee training is one of the best information security and privacy tools you have at your disposal. Uh, uh, employees that are well trained do a great job of pointing out problems in privacy and security and preventing bad things from happening. So highly re recommend that as uh, when you examine the source of the risk. Right, let's go to the next, uh, uh, the next slide. So risk likelihood. Um, if you have a lot of, of useful data, you can make an argument that you want to uh, 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 quantitatively decide what the risk likelihood is, that is to say, to give a percentage. In uh, most cases, I do it qualitatively. I say it's going to be low risk, medi elevated, medium, or high risk. Um, so I would just note that and say, based on everything we've, we've looked so far, um, that the risk likelihood is X. It's elevated, for example or it's limited, or whatever term you want to use, but describe what the qualitatively, if not quantitatively, what the risk likelihood is, and then what's the severity of the impact. Um, if uh, we lo lost HR data, for example, it could be devastating. Um, the uh, OPM, uh, Office of Personal Management uh, hack that happened a couple of years ago, that was disastrous. Uh, the severity was extremely high to US national security because of all that personal data that was out um, now in the wild, as it were. Um, what's the capability of the risk sources? Unfortunately, um, employees that are, that are not well trained on security and privacy have a great capability of doing harm, either because they're mishandling data um, or they're otherwise doing something that's going to expose you to, uh, to, to greater problems, greater risk. And then based upon everything that you've seen thus far, ask yourself, knowing what we know, is a DPIA required versus is it uh, recommended versus is it not required? Um, one of the limitations, I think, of, of Article um, 35 is this idea of either something's high risk or it's not. If it's high risk, DPI is required. If it's not, then no DPIA. I think that's a little too binary, but um, at this point, that's what the letter of the law says. If it's, if it's uh, two or more criteria that we talked about earlier, um, the nine criteria that I cited, if two or more of those are, uh, are relevant, you likely have a high risk. Doing this examination will confirm that, or it'll add, add more evidence, if, if you will, that there may be a high risk. Uh, when in doubt, again, do the DPIA. I, I really believe you won't be sorry. You'll find a lot of information that you probably wouldn't have found any other way. Uh, Doug, again, I'm going to take a, a stop here. Um, any questions or comments from the audience? None in the queue at this point, Scott. Oh, um, okay. actually, well, actually, we just had one uh, come up. Um, okay. So do you have to be a legal person, um, a lawyer or so, to initiate or even execute a DPIA, or do you need to have a legal person in the DPIA team as a backup? Um, I wouldn't say you need them to, to run this, but you do need them on the team, and not just as a backup. They should be a part of this. Because as I mentioned earlier, um, there'll be contracts involved, almost certainly, unless you've got a homebrew system that is behind your own firewall. Um, but still, even with that, um, uh, you know, the joke we, ha we have, Doug, about there's always a lawyer. Um, you really want to have a lawyer on board on these projects. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the CISO was leading this, however, or if you have a DPO, if they're leading it, but always have legal on board. There, there's no downside to having legal on board. It may be that, uh, that if you're concerned about what you're going to find, that you have this under a letter of attorney client privilege that you can get from your inside counsel here in the U.S. or outside counsel in the EU. Okay, thank you. No other uh, questions in the queue. Okay. Um, so risk mitigation. Um, one of the things that you're going to want to note in, in, in great detail, what risk mitigation uh, methodologies are you putting in place, both administrative and technical? So, and these are just some examples of technical, um, encryption, anonymization, pseudonymization. So we're all familiar with encryption. Um, anonymization, if those of you that are in the medical field, you're probably well-versed with anonymized data. A pseudonymized data, the idea that you are swapping out one data element for another uh, so that it essentially you're, you're obscure, obscuring the original one is, is a great idea. Um, I rarely see it in practice. Uh, and if you've been on our, our webinars before, you know that um, typically that's the case in credit card processing. Uh, pseudonymization is very common. It's called tokenization. And uh, that's used to swap out uh, digits uh, on a credit card number for, um, for just characters, and that they can then restore those digits when you want to do the process or the transaction. Um, so those are our technical means 
Um, I, I'm a big fan of the administrative ones, though. So background checks, just making sure that you're not hiring the, the, the wrong people. Um, you can really um, do so much damage just hiring the wrong person and having them um, either because they're not competent or because they're bad guys for whatever reason. So background checks crucial. Training, I mentioned training earlier. Training is so valuable. Um, I think companies do not spend nearly as much time and money as they should on training on security and privacy. Uh, you can do so much with training, and it doesn't have to. You don't have to spend a lot of time with it. Um, I remember um, my former company. We used to have uh, data privacy and security training usually every three months, and um, we would only take about 10 minutes. But we bring up all the things that are the most important thing, whether it was phishing at the moment or ransomware or not putting in random USB drives into your to your computer, all kinds of things. Little things like that really brought awareness um, into play. Two-person integrity, making sure that if you've got crucial data that, that is really uh, something that could ha cause harm, that two people are involved in processing it um, or reviewing it or approving it so that one person can't run amok, for example. And the list goes on and on, but the idea is you want to make a long list of risk mitigation measures that you're going to put in place uh, at or are in place at the time of the DPIA. A DPA is really a snapshot, so I always I get the question, well, suppose we're going to put in these things. Well, that's great, but really I'm looking at what you're doing right now. Um, if the system had went live today, what would it look like? Uh, and so if you don't have those measures in place, your DPI is going to come out to look pretty bad, but in practice, this is a design to get you to success. So it's not designed to, to be a negative. It's designed to say, look, if you don't have these things in place, you need to put them in place and put this on the remediation list. Let's go to the, the next um, next one, Doug. Sure, Scott. There is a question yeah. <clears throat> for sure. forensics investigations. Where do you suppose risks may be present? Oh boy, you've got a couple ones. Um, if it's an internal investigation, okay, we'll say for example, you've got the risk that you're going to violate the the uh, data subject's rights uh, because the way that works in the EU, when you do an internal investigation you have to notify the data subject very early on, like within the first two to three days that they're a target of an investigation, which is, again, to us in the U.S. is shocking. Um, you may spend a year in the U.S. here trying to track down someone who's embezzling something, but there, it's a whole different ballgame. So you really run the risk of a legal issue um, in a forensic investigation you know, in the EU uh, because perhaps you're monitoring someone's network traffic if you suspect them of doing some kind of malfeasance. So um, the danger there is you better have legal on board for a forensic investigation. I know um, when I was working on this in a former company, uh, we had to file um, special requests with the government uh, in the EU to, to do this kind of stuff just because uh, it's so invasive. So that's for forensic investigations, it's a huge risk. Also, um, when you do a forensic exam on a hard drive, for example, or on some other data store, uh, you never know what kind of data you're going you're gonna to pull up. And so it may be that you have a redaction team that you have to put on there to uh, look for things that are personal but are not relevant to the investigation. Um, certainly here in the U.S., that's done in, um, uh, at the cases where at a federal level, um, sometimes uh, for really just sensitive stuff, you'll have the, an FBI investigation. They'll have a redaction team that's involved just to screen out um, highly sensitive or personal data or trade secrets or those kinds of things. So I hope that answers that. Great. There's another question. Yeah. What are your recommendations for addressing email systems within large multinational companies, and uh, should the focus be on preventing data from entering the email environment, or should the focus be on implementing risk mitigating controls such as encryption? I think the latter, and, and the reason I say that, that um, not the former is because here's the problem, is that uh, preventing data from entering the environment, uh, it, it's very tough. People put all kinds of stuff on email, and there's just really no effective way um, unless you you have a very, very good DLP backed by data, uh, discovering classification that's going to shut things down. It's, it's just very hard to keep things. Well, one of the examples that you could, could do um, is for your data classification is identify national identification numbers. Here in the U.S. it's an SSN, but overseas they have all kinds of different variations. Um, and use your DLP to stop those things. So I think that's a technical measure, but really mitigation is, in my view, the way to go. Again, training people. Um, not to do things, not to put things um, on email they shouldn't be putting, and, and enforcing that, whether it's through, again, DLP or something else. Um, it's uh, Email is, uh, is, I don't want to say email is the devil, but email is the devil. It really, there's so many bad things that happen that people do on email. Um, things that they say they shouldn't be saying, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and I'm not 
pushing DLP for any other reason except that you've got to have something examining all the packets and seeing what's going on there. So in a multinational organization, uh, that's, in my view, um, preventing it is, is going to be tough except through training. It's really going to be using technical means to, uh, to scan packets and looking for bad stuff. So I hope that helps. Great. There's a follow-up question uh, from yeah. somebody else. So business contact information, uh, email, et cetera, are PII. But if someone includes PII in a signature, does this require DPI and what uh, what need to do before using it? What do you need okay. to do before using yeah. it? Well, and by the way, let's use the phrase personal data, not PII. And I say that, I'm not being nitpicky here. Uh, personal data is an EU concept, and it's larger than PII. Uh, so it, it incorporates all kinds of things um, uh, based upon someone's social uh, or physical or mental or economic presence. It's just a much larger concept. Um, in terms of processing contact data, say you have a, a CRM system, you need to do a DPIA for that. It depends what you're collecting. Um, uh, some CRM systems can uh, have fields for just about everything. So for example, say that um, you're collecting uh, birthdays. Uh, or spouse's birthdays, or our personal addresses because you want to send your customers Christmas cards or birthday cards or what have you, um, then you have to really start thinking uh, um, about what kind of mitigation you have in place, and it probably is going to require a DPIA um, just because of the scale of it. Um, also, business contact information that's in someone's .sig file, their signature, um, it's not fair game um, in terms of just being able to use it whatever you want. And again, this is a strange concept for us in the U.S. because you would think if it's in someone's signature file, party on, you know, use it, do whatever you want with it because they're putting it out there. In the EU, business contact, for, business contact information is personal data. So if you're creating a database based upon um, scraping all that information from emails and, and populating that with your um, CRM, DPIA, because you're essentially putting together this huge intelligence database on all these parties that really didn't contemplate that. Um, and as a consequence, uh, almost certainly you'll need a DPIA. And I'm, again, I'm not saying do a DPIA just for its own sake, but you're going to find that the more data you collect, and the more you process it, the more likely you're going to wind up needing one anyway, especially if you get a lot of requests for, um, uh, for access to data or for uh, rights to be forgotten requests. At some point, you're just going to have to do the DPIA anyway. Okay, a uh, question related to the right to be forgotten. What is the best way to support the requirement to delete data, um, for example, data retention policy and mm -hmm. uh, right to be forgotten, but also maintain the ability to research and report or notify the impact of historic security breaches, for example, mm -hmm. uh, the discovery of incidents that occurred in the past? Sure. Um, for historical analytical information, you obviously don't want to throw that stuff out. Um, and I would ask yourself, what could you do that could uh, minimize the ability to identify individuals that are part of that breach, we'll say, for example, or a vent, or, you know, say that you're a SOC and you're examining, you have a history of events, and you don't want to throw those away because you want to see patterns. Um, no one's saying you have to throw those things away. I would ask yourself, is there any way to, to limit the personal data tied to that? Maybe it's a user ID or an IP address or something. Is there some way to either limit it, encrypt it, obfuscate it so that you can still do reporting, you can still decrypt it when you need to, do the report, re-encrypt it, but otherwise um, minimize your exposure. Because I'm sympathetic to InfoSec folks, you want to be able to, to look at, at, at trends and get an idea of what the bad guys are doing, and also to report to the board. Ultimately, once a year, you want to say, what are our, our biggest problems, and you want to relay those kind of, of risks. So I think, I think that's the way you address that um, from, a, um, from an information security standpoint. So I hope that answers the question. Okay, it looks like one more question. Um, okay. What opinions are out there on LinkedIn? It's integrated with a lot of CRM applications and corporations. Oh boy, that's a very good question. Um, I have not spent a lot of time on LinkedIn related DPIAs, um, but you're right. Um, any system that is integrated with other systems um, and especially if you're in the hiring business and you probably have a, a hiring mechanism using LinkedIn, um, say that if you're a recruiter, um, definitely I would contact uh, LinkedIn or any third party you're working with and ask them, well, how, how do you comply with GDPR? I think that's the first question because they're going to hopefully have good information for you to say, yeah, here are the 10 different ways we comply with GDPR. And they're going to they're cite the different sections and say, 
we, you know, Article 32, we use this information security, and, uh, and for right to be forgotten, we do things this way. I would talk to the third party first and put the onus on them to describe how they're, they're fulfilling that, and then use that as a, a, a guidepost to say, okay, here's what they're not doing, here's what we're going to have to do to, uh, to, to, to make up for that deficit. Some third parties are very good to work with. Some they will not return your phone calls, even after you've already bought the contract, basically. I'm, I'm kind of surprised at some of the vendors. I won't name them, but you all are, I'm sure, on, on, this, on this call familiar with them. Um, let's go to the, to the next part, which is um, the assessment decision and the sign-off. Um, so you're going to make a decision at some point. You're going to say, okay, um, uh, we decided that based on everything we know, we're going to, uh, the risk has been mitigated or will be mitigated when we go live. Say that you're not in a production environment yet, but you're going to go live. At that point, the risk is going to be mitigated, or you've accepted it. You've said, you know what, the risk is so low, the, re the residual risk is so low that uh, we're okay. Um, this is considered, this is not considered to be high risk anymore. Um, or you have an insurance system, and you're working with a third party to transfer the risk, whatever it might be. Now, some, some risks are not going to be transferable. Um, monetary risks are easily transferable because you can just pay someone, uh, you know, pay someone in a, in a lawsuit. You can you can settle with them. But if this is personal information that's going to, if it got if it escaped, hurt them, uh, their rights and freedoms. Again, if you're in the political commentary area, for example, you're one of those commentators uh, commentators on TV or something, then your personal information, your past, what have you, could impact your job, and that's something that that money may not necessarily fix. So you have to think about the kinds of risks that you're mitigating, accepting, and transferring. Next is um, um, uh, making a list of the residual risks um, and then ranking them and saying, okay, this is, uh, this is the, the highest risk we have here. This is the next highest. Stacking them together and saying, okay, as a consequence, is there still a high risk? Meaning that you're going to have to go to a DPA and get permission to do processing. I haven't seen a case yet where you have to do that, but this is certainly a possibility. Um, and then finally, getting sign-offs. At a minimum, um, get sign-offs from your CISO or the equivalent, your security director, um, and legal counsel, um, because really it's going to fall to them if something goes wrong, or it's going to fall to them if there is a, for example, request to right to be forgotten, you've got a subject access request, any of these things, um, those people at a minimum are going to be involved. If you have a DPO, the DPO should be involved as well, and this really is a bread and butter kind of, of, of job for the DPO to begin with if you have one. Um, but if you don't, at a minimum, get your CISO, get legal counsel to sign off on this thing. So people are accepting responsibility that, yep, we've done our homework and we know what we've gotten ourselves involved in. Let's go to the next slide, Doug. I um, want to talk about some mis misunderstandings and uh, we'll cover some more questions that we had them. Um, we can't change the system. Why bother with a DPIA? I get this occasionally. Even if you've got a legacy system you can't fix or can't change, you can still do a lot with administrative measures. So again, I mentioned earlier about background checks and multi-person integrity and, and just limiting uh, role-based access control so only certain people get certain things. Um, you can do a lot of administrative tools to keep people from misusing data. Training is a great tool as well. Next one I get is we don't have time to complete a DPIA or we don't have time to fix it. Um, my view on this is you probably have more time than you think you can do a DPIA um, in a short time if you just hit on the most dangerous elements or the most sensitive elements. Um, again, uh, if, if this is an HR system, ask yourself, are you using someone's national ID number um, as a record key uh, or something of that nature? That's going to uh, be something you probably want to fix in, in, uh, in a hurry. If you can't fix it, then find a way to mitigate it um, before you go live. But you can definitely get a DPIA done before May. Um, if you have a high-risk application, you need to hire a DPO. No, no, and no, you don't. Just because you have a high-risk application does not mean you need to have a DPO. However, if you have a DPO, they do have to be, he or she does have to be involved in your, in your DPIA process. Um, because some of the elements of why you would have a DPO are, are somewhat similar to the elements involved in DPIA, people think that if you've got a high-risk application, you must have a DPO, and that's not the case. And then finally, um, we're afraid what we might find. I get this occasionally. Um, if you're afraid what you might find doing a DPIA, get a letter of the train client privilege going with your inside counsel or outside counsel and, um, and do the whole thing under a train client privilege. And that way, if you're concerned, there might be malfeasance or there might be employee negligence and it's going to open up some exposure. 
you don't want this winding up um, uh, as part of a e-discovery disclosure, then do it under attorney client privilege. But do that ahead of time. Don't wait till you find bad stuff and then call your attorney. It's going to be too late by that. So, um, Doug, we've got a, a couple more minutes. If there's more questions, otherwise I'll uh, give some final thoughts. No questions in the queue at the moment, Scott. Okay. So, um, just my thoughts here. Uh, a DPIA is ultimately a risk management tool and a living document. Um, whenever you make a change to a system that you've done DPIA for, you want to go back and ask those same questions, which I know is a pain, but the point of it is the DPIA is not shelfware. You want to use that um, constantly update it as you get more um, information, or I'm saying, I'd say probably more uh, qualitative changes to the system. So either you're adding more data elements you're collecting, you're sharing it with different people, um, you've got a new process or whatever it is, go back to your DPIA and say, is this in, in introducing risk that we didn't think about earlier? Um, there's no such thing at this point as a medium risk. It's either high risk or no risk, but to the degree that you find what you consider to be medium risk, um, I would still recommend doing DPIA because you never know when that risk is going to elevate and go into higher risk. Um, the uh, document I cited a couple times here, WP248, highly recommend it. Um, NX2, I know it's too tiny to see, but that's at the right. That's a nice checklist that we have there. Um, it's, a, it's a very good document. I recommend everyone on the call read that because you'll get a lot of good information there that I, I couldn't share with you today. Also, the ICO document um, that I cited a couple times, very good reading. It's, it's 50 or so pages, but well worth reading. Um, also, um, there's a new ISO standard that I have not reviewed yet um, for doing DPIAs. So um, if anyone does review that or use that, please do let me know. I'd like to know how, it's, um, how it worked out for you. And then finally, it's not too late to start. Um, we've got about five months left before May, May 25th. But um, if you get started in January, um, you will make it. You just have to uh, prioritize it, but you can get this done. So that's, uh, that's it, Doug. Uh, if, there, if there's no questions, I'll just turn things back over to you. Yeah, there's just uh, two more questions. Is there a di okay. uh, di significant, significant difference between PIA and the DPIA? Oh, you know what? That's a great question. I don't know. Um, I've never had to do uh, – because uh, PIAs, by the way, folks, are uh, privacy impact assessments. Usually it's U.S. federal government mandated for federal systems. Um, I've not done one for the federal government, so I don't know how close the two are. Okay. Um, last question is, how will the EU pursue violations by U.S. companies who have no presence um, in the EU? What they'll or, likely or, or, do – the... Sorry, presence yep. or business in the EU? Sure. Um, my likely um, is what they'll do is they'll go to the FTC and they'll ask the FTC to go lean on and, and punish the company in question. Um, I, I, people sometimes disagree with me on this, but um, keep in mind that because the FTC didn't do a good job um, uh, earlier pursuing uh, privacy, um, Safe Harbor was torpedoed as, as a result. So my guess is that's what they're going to do is get the FTC involved or state's attorneys general um, because that's often a payday for them um, because the violation may be a violation that's going on here in the U.S. they don't know about. Great. There are no other questions. So uh, thank you very much, Scott. We're at the top of the hour, so this concludes today's webinar. A copy of the uh, recording and a, a, a copy of the PowerPoint slides will be sent to all the registrants and participants in the next couple of days. Uh, thank you very much, Scott. This is great information. Oh, you're most welcome. Thanks for, for having me. All right, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you.